Good evening and welcome to Gana Shot. And on behalf of the CASA uh, Forum, I welcome you to this joint webinar of CASA and Gana Shot on Bangladesh and what's next in Bangladesh. To join me in this webinar are eminent personalities. First, let me welcome them. On screen, you see General Gautam Murthy and you see Ambassador Gautam Mukhopadhyay. General Atta Hasnain will uh, join us very shortly. Uh, all of you are familiar with General Gautam Murthy. He's been coming frequently on uh, webinars. I wouldn't introduce him to you, but General uh, Ambassador Gautam Mukhopadhyay, he's come first time on Ganeshot in this format. Uh, for your information, he's been our ambassador to uh, Myanmar. He's also been our ambassador to Afghanistan. In fact, way back in 2001, he was just telling me after NDC, he went and set up the embassy in Afghanistan. So he knows Afghanistan very well and as also Syria. He comes with a wealth of experience, uh, ambassador for three countries. I mean, I don't need to introduce him more. Now, we all know, you know, Bangladesh, uh, we are just about a month past its monsoon uh, revolution, right? What in the past one month, things were turbulent. Now things seem to be settling down to some extent. ATMs have opened up some sense of normal, uh, for, you know, for people to draw money. And, uh, you know, limits on those draws and all have gone down. Yeah, there comes uh, General Hasnain. So, welcome. Good evening. Ah, great, great to have great, you back. Great to see Ambassador right. Mukhbadi here also. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, General Atta. Right. You. So, as I was telling, sir, uh, you know, things are limping back to some sense of normalcy in Bangladesh. Uh, but then, things are not exactly normal. There are a lot of shuffling around. The interim government uh, is trying to do a lot of things. The political you know, environment is still hazy. The political activity has not kicked in. It's after all just one month past this uh, tumultuous revolution. Uh, what you have today is 175 million Bangladeshis who are completely, you know, uh, full of passion uh, of revolution. Uh, and the, I mean, I must say that they're all pretty industrious, hardworking. And a lot of them are disappointed in what's happened to them. And they have a certain amount of trepidation as to what their future is. And But then, they're all quite positive that they'll come out well. Right. But having said this, let's get to some real facts. We no, must understand that Bangladesh remains a country with very little natural resources. Right. And it had developed over the past 15 years, especially its garment industry. Uh, with just the industry of the people and they established a name for themselves their economy was doing well till the covid the covid destroyed their economy they had to go to the imf and then this event has happened so they had to virtually restart their economy uh, also bangladesh has a history you know of uh, violent power transfer uh, and any power transfer in bangladesh has not been smooth Invariably, the person who assumes power puts the other person in jail or finishes him off. So this history is there. And this has repeated itself after 15 years uh, in some manner. In fact, in a more violent manner. Uh, or I won't say violent manner, in a more assertive manner. Right. And Bangladesh has this unique thing of being completely surrounded by India, except the small patch with Myanmar. Uh, it. I would say that Bangladesh and India are interlocked with each other, right? And their futures are largely dependent on each other. And uh, that's how it is, whether it's water, electricity, oil, whatever it is, the basic issues have to largely, are today largely flowing from India. But at the same time, post this revolution, where, where there's a feeling in Bangladesh that we were completely supporting uh, Sheikh Hasina, and since Sheikh Hasina is in India, there is an antipathy towards India. And at the same time, there is a propensity to go towards China, which was already there even when Sheikh Hasina was there. In fact, if you all remember, Sheikh
Sheikh Hasina was good at playing out between India, Bangladesh, sorry, India and China and all other powers, right? Also, it has shown an inkling of going back and reopening its relationship or, and normalizing its relationship with uh, Pakistan, especially uh, getting some ammunition from there and all that. So a whole lot of things are happening. Uh, to a large extent, uh, what's happening in Bangladesh has happened a little while back in Maldives, started with the India Out program, where things went awry with them. And today what is happening is the President News is shortly going to come and visit India on a state visit and already getting into some kind of seeking an FTA. The reality of India is sinking into Maldives, right? As much as what antipathy we see from uh, Bangladesh, I think India needs to have strategic patience. And that bit of strategic patience is what General Hasnain has written about. And we'd like him to dwell on this and where we go in that, right? Uh, we, while we have to have this strategic patient and all that, we also have to realize that another neighbor of us, Myanmar, which is quite close to Bangladesh, is also in some kind of a problem. And that problem has been there for the past two years. So we have got, uh, Ambassador Gautam Mukhopadhyay, who will bring in this connect between Bangla, what's happening in Bangladesh, what's happening in Myanmar, and how does it affect India and where does how does India navigate? So to that extent, today's seminar webinar is not only what what next in Bangladesh, what next for India in this complete region is the larger issue which needs to be addressed. Uh, with this, we'll start the webinar. My request to all those people from Bangladesh who are watching and quite a lot of you have uh, joined in and I'm very happy. Please be positive in your thinking. Because ultimately, what we need to do is we have to go to a uh, you know, situation where India and Bangladesh are good neighbors. We, whether, you know, at your own internal level, whatever you had with Sheikh Hasina is one different thing. India and Bangladesh are, as countries have developed reasonably good relations in the past 15 years. Our aim should be to take it forward, right? And I would like you to be uh, positive in your outlook and... Of course, you can have different outlooks, uh, uh, views about it. Uh, that's natural. And like I said, in this time uh, where you've gone through a, a, you know, quite an mm -hmm. upheaval in the past, just about a month back, things are expected not to be completely normal. Okay. With this, I'd request uh, General Gautam Murthy, sir, please, uh, uh, the floor is yours. But before you start off, what I'd like to say is I'd request all of you, to spend about 10 to 15 minutes on what you feel is okay, your views about the whole affair. Uh, I will not uh, stop you. Just go ahead because I, I, I dare not stop people of such eminence speaking uh, to public at large. Right. And um, uh, then we'll see where we go, take some questions or what, uh, you know, I'll pick up questions from what you have said and we'll have a discussion thereafter. The whole idea is to wrap it up in about an hour and hour and 15 minutes. General Gautam Murthy, sir, all yours. Uh, thank you, General Shankar, for this uh, very, very comprehensive introduction. Good evening to you, my fellow panelists. Good evening to the viewers of the channel. And welcome to our Kasas and Gunner Shot 57th webinar on this subject. If you recollect our last uh, webinar on Bangladesh, uh, on the boil, that was the subject, had had over 40,000 views. Uh, that just shows as how topical Bangladesh is and how most of us who are thinking well for our countries, for India and for Bangladesh, uh, feel about it and do not want a situation of turmoil. The situation continues, uh, as General Shankar said, it remains complex, it is fluid, but at the same time, there is a semblance of uh, order coming back. The interim government, which is head, headed by Dr. Mohammed Yunus, who we all know, and about a month, he's undertaken several initiatives to stabilize Bangladesh. But a myriad challenges remain. I will, in my part of uh, the talk here, 
focus mainly on the challenges that Bangladesh faces and uh, where it can go from here. Now, the key challenge which uh, he was tackling was law and order and is continues to be law and order. The government has been dealing with uh, widespread protests. Police were on strike. There were high crime rates. Although some progress has been made, restoring full law and order remains a critical challenge. And I do not know what pressure the government has come under, or rather, I think I know what pressure the government has come under. But leaders of banned organizations and over 20 notorious criminals have been released from jail on bail. Now, this has sparked widespread criticism amongst most Bangladeshi. Uh, the elephant in the room is the killing and the atrocities against Hindus by some Islamic fundamentalists. Although the killings may have stopped, but uh, the Hindus living there as a minority are feeling threatened. Almost 52 districts were affected. On 1st August, actually just before losing power, the Awami League banned the Jamaat Islami in Bangladesh and its student wing that we spoke about, the Islamic Chhatra Shibir. But on 28th of August, the new government has reversed its decision. Then the national holiday on August 15th, which was observed in uh, honor of Sheikh Mujib's death, that has been revoked. The interim government also dissolved the Awami League's Judicial Investigation Committee. Several laws have been amended and many have been repealed, which had special provisions for security of uh, Sheikh Mujib's family members. So internally, Bangladesh continues to be in a bit of a turmoil, though not as bad as it was right in the beginning. As far as economic, uh, the economic front is, is concerned, the economy is under great strain due to inflation, unemployment, and it's a huge reliance on government exports. The interim government is focusing on public spending and is uh, attracting foreign investments, as we all know that uh, Professor Mohammed Yunus is headed towards the US. The financial liabilities are huge. There is a total of, on the power sector alone, there is 800 million in, in, in uh, 3.7 billion in debt. And Bangladesh is overdue on 492 million only to the Adani group. So the interim government needs a financial assistance and Prophet, uh, Professor Mohammed Yunus is the right man as of now to get this financial assistance. You know, in fact, I'd like to tell your viewers that 10% uh, of Bangladesh GDP comes from uh, Indian industries that have invested in Bangladesh. So the most immediate impact we have seen is a slowdown because instability creates uncertainty, not good for business, not good for manufacturing. We all know that. Even before this crisis took place, the inflation was on a 12-year high at 11.66%. Food inflation was 14.1%. This was before the revolution. So you can imagine what it has uh, reached now. Uh, job creation, unemployment, all these problems that bedevil the subcontinent is increasing in Bangladesh. If foreign exchange reserves have drastically declined and therefore <coughs> Bangladesh needs to set in its house in order in order to improve on the economic front. Political landscape we all know is highly volatile. The government needs to create an environment for con which is conducive to fair and free as well as inclusive elections. And they have to manage the demand of various political factions, especially of the Jamaat e Islami and such other parties. Like in Pakistan, I'm afraid that these uh, people, although they don't get the percentage of votes, but they punch well above their weight and have a serious impact on, uh, on the polity over there. Gaining and maintaining public trust is very crucial to this interim government. It must demonstrate its ability to address the grievances of the population, particularly the youth who have been a driving force behind these movements. The government has carried out some judicial reforms and administrative reforms. As we all know, it keeps coming about the judges resigned and the new set have been uh, sworn in. Significant changes have been made. But let us see where this takes Bangladesh. 
therefore addressing the internal security issues including the recovery of arms and ammunition is vital for its long term stability as far as foreign affairs is concerned we have addressed uh, gautam mukhopadhyay with that and i therefore will not dwell on this but yes the government does uh, has done uh, taken some decisions which you know which which sound very uh, pure like for example ex banning the export of hilsa to india during the forthcoming durga puja period you know although professor mohammad yunus has very clearly stated and the ministers have very clearly stated that no india affected project uh, india indian project will get affected but at the same time you know actions like this undermine uh, a lot of goodwill the other elephant in the room which i would like to dwell upon is as i said is uh, the fundamentalism uh, particularly what we have seen even during the last 15 years and earlier too there is a disquiet within the government of india on this issue now the, the present government of bangladesh the interim government for the first time has included a muslim religious leader in its so called cabinet the governing cabinet the student leadership student led government uh, have very clearly said that they will they've pledged to pursue a policy against all kinds of discrimination and uphold the secular democratic principles that is a, a very good sign that they have said it but the freedom from uh, that uh, bangladesh is now witnessing has also given rise and given space to these undemocratic fascist and fundamentalist elements to raise their ugly heads there has been a, a vandalism rampant with destruction of some statues and sculptures including that of sheikh mujibur rahman that we all know there have been series of incidents in which teachers in colleges and universities were forced to resign and in one incident a professor who had objected to islamic prayer events inside the university was forced to resign and the students forced him to listen to the recitals from the quran several sufi shrines have been vandalized uh, in fact one of the fundamentalist speakers on august 30th and that sort of surprised me has said long live islamic fundamentalism we believe in islamic fundamentalism none has been able to do politics excluding muslim fundamentalists and none shall be able to now these kind of statements are not Uh, i mean it's a democratic country anybody is free to say what they want but as i said this leads to a sense of disquiet amongst other incidents a section of bangladesh uh, civil society members consider warning signs or public rallies poster campaigns by uh, a banned terror group and the release of this uh, mufti jesh uddin rahmani who was the leader of the ansarullah bangla team which uh, was renamed as ansar al islam now the civil society of bangladesh uh, let me tell your viewers is opposed to this kind of thing and no right thinking person because they have seen peace they have seen economic growth and everybody was benefited but yes uh, perhaps sheikh hasina's regime went a little too far in being a strong one party regime and that led to a ulster but besides that the people of bangladesh and the people of india have no uh, quarrel really the quarrel is within bangladesh and yes there have been some rumblings against uh, india and that india you know sort of put all the eggs in one basket and that sort of thing but i don't think that's right we are reaching out and uh, both the governments are headed by very sensible and eminent people and they will be speaking to each other and seeing what best comes out of it uh apart from that uh the bangladesh uh, this leadership does not want to take again any hard approach against any one at this moment and therefore this kind of thing uh, will continue there will be people who will be speaking out but my appeal and my understanding is that the government of the day they should not get carried away neither should india get distracted by these elements and uh, got of and sort of get into knee jerk reactions uh, apart from that 
there has been this call to change the national anthem of Bangladesh, which was vociferously turned down by the interim government to say that there is no question of uh, this controversy coming up. And uh, in fact, the religious affairs advisor, to his credit, has gone to say that those who attack places of worship are the enemies of humanity, they're criminals, and they will be prosecuted against the existing laws. Uh, but uh, be that as it may, let us see how strong this government is in curbing this. And uh, to my mind, the, the canary in the mind will be this year's Durga Puja and how it is observed by the Hindus of Bangladesh. Will it be observed with total freedom? Will there be curves? Will there be incidents against uh, their observance? It is left to be seen. In conclusion, all I'd like to say is that the interim government will continue to focus on restoring order. We would be implementing reforms. But that said, the situation remains unpredictable and much will depend on how effectively these measures are implemented and whether the government can get gain complete public support. Will the elections be announced this year? It's anyone's guess. Will the Awami League be permitted to participate? That again is a question that uh, bothers some. So we shall have to wait and watch as to where uh, Bangladesh is headed and what's next for Bangladesh. Thank you, General Shankar. Uh, thank you, sir. I think you made some very important points. Uh, law and order is still a problem. The situation is unpredictable. Hindus remain, I mean, they feel threatened still. And a lot of revisionism underway, and which is to be expected in a situation of upheaval of this kind. Uh, right, the economy continues to be under strain. Again, understandable. Uh, but they're trying to reopen the uh, garment sector up. The, it was supposed to have opened up over the weekend. I don't know where it has gone. I suppose the news will come out. Uh, Bangladesh remains saddled with a huge financial liability, and inflation is running high. The major issue is that what you made pointed out is that the interim government must go through go towards a political uh, stability. Uh, having stabilized the situation, go have uh, elections which are inclusive and encompass all parties, all sections of the society, and not you know go with an Islamist strain to a fundamentalist strain, which is not good either for Bangladesh or for India and Bangladesh uh, relations, right? And um, yeah, and what you important thing which you said is, yeah, in this, in this time, there are going to be knee-jerk reactions, which we need not have knee-jerk, you know, I mean, let's like say knee-jerk actions do uh, need not trigger knee-jerk reactions from both sides, yeah. right? Uh, the positive thing which I see is the national anthem, which I think they have said no, it will not be changed because there was not only the national anthem, there was a call to change the national flag also. Both yes. have been turned down, which is good, right? It just indicates there's a deep sense of balance somewhere down below, which gives you some hope, right? What I'd like to say is, at this point of time, a lot of Bang Bangladeshis are feeling entitled and you know anti-India. I agree, but a point which you made, which I'd like to highlight, it takes two hands to clap, right? And it takes two hands to build goodwill. And the idea is not to see what the sound of the clap is. The idea is to work towards building goodwill towards each other. Like I said in the beginning, we are neighbors. You can't wish that away. And we are, we've got a border of 4,000 kilometers. You can't wish that away. Right, we are interlocked with each other, and that's a phrase which I learned from our uh, uh, external affairs minister in one of his talks, which he said. Right. I, uh, having said this, I now request uh, General Atta Hasnain, sir, your views all over to you, sir. Thank you, uh, General Shankar. Thank you very much. Very, very timely. Your you know, voice, uh, I, sir. Your Sound if you could. One sec. Yes, sir. I think that will be. Am I uh, more? Am, yeah, am I better. better? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, sir. Right, right. Thank you very much once again. And I thought you started with a, a brilliant uh, introduction, giving out the facts. Absolutely. 
threadbare. Having said that, I am you're still low, sir. So your st voice is still low. You might have to push it up. I can barely. One second, let me just push this. Better now? Yeah, good. Is it okay? Can you hear me? Can we can, sir? Okay, right. Uh, just got my chain of thought <laughs> disturbed, <laughs> but that, that that doesn't matter. While I was listening to General Murthy, I was also reading all the comments which were coming on uh, on our on our website here. Uh, I was disturbed. Well, uh, I do think that the government of India is handling this extremely well. We have not had a statement which has been out of place. You know, governments can tend to jump into situations where they think, they perceive things going against them. Things which they have carefully built over a period of time, relationships, etc. When do they get overnight, when they get upset? Uh, do you find all kinds of commentaries coming out of government? Government has not made a statement on this at all. And I think... Our, our, our foreign minister, our prime minister, everyone has been has treated this with a sense of equanimity and a sense of balance. I wish the same thing could be said for the comments which are coming here. Unfortunate. Very good. To you. We have the freedom to comment. We are, we are a democratic country. But remember, these are the comments which are hurting. And uh, they are hurting both ways. It's not that from in the Indian side, these comments are going negative. They're coming from the other side too. I know that passions are alive at the moment. Lots of things. The streets are alive. Perhaps to an extent, they are quietening down in Bangladesh. But it is not helpful for anyone. Just remember, we are wedded to each other. We are interlocked, as John Shankar just said. We are interlocked with each other. And uh, you can't choose your neighbors. You can't take them away. Correct. So the best thing is to is to look at these situations as temporary situations, passage of times. Human emotions are inevitable; they come up. We are we are not uh, you know made in in any godly way that there will be no emotions and there will be no sentiment. They will be there. Perhaps we have gone wrong. I'm not saying that we the, we may have gone wrong in our commitment, over commitment to one side or the other in Bangladesh, that's something debatable. Well, we can keep discussing that, right? But at the end of the day, at what is the best thing for the people of Bangladesh and what is the best thing for the people of India? To roll back the situation and come back to an element of stability. I have written an article on this this morning, which appeared in the, in the, the New Indian Express. It was called, it was termed strategic patience. It was on strategic patience. And I looked at Ukraine and I looked at Gaza and I looked at Afghanistan and different areas around the world. And I saw, I observed the Indian policy towards everything. We have retained our composure. We have retained our equanimity and sense of balance right through. And you see the manner in which the Honorable Prime Minister, when he went to Ukraine, the statements that he made came out from there. What has emerged from it? Nothing in a hurry at all. Hurry in this kind of a situation can lead to all kinds of awkwardities. And uh, if there is such a word. But uh, but my appeal to people, please hold your passion. Hold your sentiments at this time of the year, uh, 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 you know, of uh, uh, our, our passage of times. And you will find this will go away. And then when you see this with a sense of balance, automatically solutions will come. You see what happened in Sri Lanka. Right? I think it's a very good case study. And you see the relationship today. Right? Yes, I know there are elections taking place and there's a likelihood of a change of government and some different ideologies coming in, etc. And lots of people are contemplating what's going to happen. But the last couple of years, ever since 1987, when we went into, into Sri Lanka, the, the situation was very, very dynamic, up and down. The people of Sri Lanka were very upset with India at most times. But you've seen in recent years how we have overcome it. In the worst of times, Sri Lanka received a $4 billion loan assistance, actually, uh, to get them out of, their, of the, out of the woods, of the economy. So this is how you have to look at being neighbors. 
Now, we understand fully that uh, the situation on the streets is one of only five weeks down at the moment. We are only five weeks away from what could be called a revolution in Bangladesh. And uh, no harsh words need to be spoken by us in India. It is for the people of Bangladesh to decide what they wish to do, what government they wish to have. But the implications of that on our security must not be negative. This is important for us. This is what they have to remember. We wish Bangladesh well. We wish the people of Bangladesh well. Remember, our national security, India's national security is intertwined with you in Bangladesh. You cannot wish that away at all. Right? We have got, uh, we've got a vulnerable Northeast. We are aware of uh, the intents of our other adversaries. And without naming anyone, looking at that area, perhaps at the moment, very, very happy that they're wringing their hands and saying, okay, this is the ideal situation for them. Temptations galore, some uh, sleeper agents and sleeper networks, etc., being reactivated. All that is fine. You can go on. We will, we will neutralize that in times to come. But uh, just understand that it's important for us to continue to be looking at each other, being engaged with each other in a positive ma manner and not in with any sense of negativity. What are the issues here at the moment in terms of national security? Uh, Jan Murthy has already spoken most of the things in terms of the situation internally in Bangladesh. In terms of national security, I would put number one, the issue of communalism. I would be the unhappiest to see the targeting of any of the minorities. I'm a member of the minority community in India. And I think I, I can display a model here for people to see, right? Why shouldn't there be an equivalent element like me in Bangladesh who should be able to speak up and say, I feel very safe and secure in my country. I'm sure there are many of them, right? And I was in Bangladesh some years ago and uh, I still remember 28,000 Pandals. This is just before in, uh, Diwali that I was there, uh, before Durga Puja. And I was told by the Bangladesh Army who were escorting me around there at that time mm -hmm. that, sir, we have got 28,000 pandals in Dhaka. And wow. all of them are, going, them are going to be live, absolutely. And you see the kind of Durga Puja that we have in Dhaka. It can parallel, it, it, it can match Kolkata. That is the in kind of intensity with which Durga Puja is, is celebrated here. So when Janmurti says that is a is a is a important juncture when we arrive at the time of Durga Puja next month, the ability of the minority community to celebrate that and what Bangladesh should feel proud about is to project to the world. We've had a revolution. We have decided to do so and so. And yet our people, no one is to be harmed. We will protect them. I'm so glad I was hearing news that uh, Possibly many of the madarsas are going to be recruited to make sure that they patrol and they, and yes. they ensure the security of uh, all the minority uh, elements of the minority community in Dhaka and uh, other cities. What a, what a great model you will present to the rest of the world. You will perhaps present a fantastic model to the whole of South Asia. You will present that model yes. to Pakistan in a, in a huge way. So this is the kind of thing that we should be looking at, projection of positivity. Because it is this which will ultimately lead to, I'm not looking at solutions. There are no solutions here. It's a question of maximizing our comfort levels with each other. I thought we had achieved a fairly high comfort level, which has now taken a downturn suddenly. I've served with the Bangladesh army. And I can tell you, in difficult times. I was there with them in Rwanda. And uh, I can tell you, we had the best sense of cooperation between the between the two countries and the two armies. I have uh, served, I have visited Bangladesh, I have visited all the military institutions in Bangladesh. And I can tell you, uh, our exchange of sentiments and emotions about our history, the past, our jointness, etc., everything. I think Bangladesh puts it, that, that aspect on a pedestal and keeps that as a very important element of its relationship with India. 
we similarly do that. I, for one, would always be the one of the first things I did in, in when I came to Dhaka was to go to the Martyrs Memorial, go to the museum, and have things like that because those are the things which excite us. How did things happen here in 1971? How did Bangladesh create itself? Whatever support from India came, it was different. But how did it create itself? So these are some of the aspects which need to be revisited from time to time to keep the positive sentiments going. As I said, the most important aspect is to ensure there is just no negativity at this particular time. If you, if you really look at it, sit down together and discuss, you will find that our differences between India and Bangladesh are far lesser than the aspects of convergence of our interests. As we just brought out, economics. Well, India is on the on the rise, fastest growing large economy of the world. We will be the fourth, third economy, hopefully the second largest economy in the in the, the future, inshallah, some of them one of these days. In, in the future, we are looking at a five trillion, a ten trillion dollar economy. When that happens, the region goes with us. It's not just India which uh, which uh, develops. And there I say, Bangladesh has a record of. 25 million people being lifted from poverty by the simple uh, just the virtue of its uh, development economics and who is better than Muhammad Yunus Saab who can yeah. talk about development economics so it's not a question of Bangladesh bandwagoning on India it's a question of how can we do this jointly because this is going to not only the growth of Bangladesh is not only going to be helpful to us otherwise in the rest of India, but the northeast of India particularly. And we've got Ambassador Gautam Mukhapadhyay who will speak about this, I'm sure. He's an expert, absolute expert on the northeast, knows that area backwards. Obviously, the development of that area is hugely linked to how things develop in, in, in uh, Bangladesh. And I can tell you, both the economies of those regions, the region and the nation can grow conjointly together. The second, the, the other aspect is power. Uh, a lot, I mean, India is, is today mercifully with a lot of investments which have happened from the private sector, etc., and infrastructure which has gone in. Uh, we are, we have a lot of power available with us today. Bangladesh is that the deficient of power. I'm sure that all this can be made up through the availability from India. This is something which will keep the Bangladesh economy going. We cannot afford to have a downturn in the Bangladesh economy at all. You are one of the, in fact, the Bangladesh, Bangladesh economy is maybe considered virtually like one of the Asian tiger economies of the past. That's, that's yes. what it had come to almost, right? And you can't see a downturn in this happening in, 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 in this current um, times purely because the streets are in turbulence. No. There is a question somewhere in the question box. Is the textile industry, is the clothing industry from... Bangladesh shifting into India? Well, there are lots of rumors which keep floating around on all these things. I don't think decisions of this kind are taken overnight like that with situations. We should be a little more mature in looking at this. If Bangladesh retrieves the situation, if the leadership retrieves the situation, democracy returns fully. You have a stable government in place. You have a good relationship between the with the neighbors. There's no reason why the marvel that you have created in terms of uh, the, the industry, textiles and the clothing industry should not retain its place. The privacy, $60 billion worth of exports, which you have been able to achieve over the past, something which can be restored completely. So one can go on and on uh, on these various aspects. But I strongly believe that one of the very important aspects which will happen here is military diplomacy. Diplomacy is one aspect, but military diplomacy is another. We have got a very eminent diplomat with us. I request him to also um, talk about this aspect. We have got a wonderful relationship with the Bangladesh Army, the Bangladesh Armed Forces. We've got a historical relationship. We, I personally consider it to be a very, very professional force. And I think in this entire issue which has happened so far, it has stood out as an element of a complete sense of balance. And I think with whom... India can ensure that it became a kind of a wire media with the people to ensure that we continue to maintain our 
sense of balance and, and equanimity. Um, I think I will not go beyond this because uh, there's a lot which already has been covered. This issue of radicalism, fundal, fundamentalism, Rohingyas, Myanmar, all this is linked to everything which I have already spoken about. I think this is really the time when we should be just wishing that the situation, I mean, it should just play itself out, burn itself out, as it says. Because it's not necessary to react and respond to every statement coming out. Under these circumstances, every action which is being taken, you'll find in six months' time, we will be discussing this on in another webinar here itself. And I'm sure the stance that we see in the various remarks, the comments on the comments box, will be very, very different at that time. Thank you very much for your time. God bless and Jai Hind. Uh, thanks a lot, sir. I think you outlined the whole story of strategic patience very well right one has to wait not react to every situation not react to every word which is being spoken and not be antipathetic to each other just have patience to absorb what comes and not honestly shoot our mouths off that's i think very important and you said just about five weeks after all it's happened this is a big upheaval in the in a in a nation It'll take time. It's a wound which is going to heal. Every wound takes time to heal. And that healing time will not run away. Right. Uh, I think you conveyed a very important thing, sir. Like you said, this is the third time I'm having this talk on various uh, fora on Bangladesh. I see a lot of, uh, I would say, uh, hate coming out of Bangladeshis and Indians, both. It is some kind of a, whether it is started off as, you know, just as a reflex moment, I wouldn't understand, no. But I think we need to reduce this. We re need to reduce this rhetoric. We need to reduce the fact that we start pointing out uh, defects with each other and point out who's done mistake and who's not done a mistake. It's tutu is good for soap operas, not, not between nations, right? That's my, you know, desi way of putting it. it. And what uh, General Hasnan has said, which is very important, and we keep this thing, it is not only being interlocked with each other, or security is also intertwined with each other. Yes. Uh, it's not only Bangladesh, it's India also. And we both have to recognize each other's red lines, right? You have your problems, we need to understand it. We understand it very well. You also understand it very well. But that's a thing which we need not cross over and over again because that crossing these red lines only uh, results in uh, ill feelings with each other i thought in the past 15 years this enclaves being sorted out or border being straightened out uh, contributed a lot to the understanding of the whole story because i remember going back you know way back with all these enclaves managing the tripura border used to be a problem because, you know, uh, half a house used to be in one side and the other half of the house on the other side, virtually something like that. So those things have been sorted out well. And I think that goes further. I do understand that the river water, uh, you know, uh, treaty and, you know, those talks have to make progress, but they'll make progress only when we talk with each other and trust each other. Right. And there are inimical powers, inimical both to Bangladesh and to us which we have to get together and resolve because these powers don't mean any good to Bangladesh. That I can assure you. Having seen Bangladesh right from, uh, you know, younger days, uh, right from the time I was second lieutenant when I went to Binaguri, which is quite close to the, uh, you know, North Bengal border. I, this thing one has seen, right? We need not allow communalism to raise its head unnecessarily. And to that extent, I think, uh, uh, the Durga Puja is not only, a, won't, I wouldn't look, like to call it an asset test of what Bangladesh is. I think there's a great opportunity like what uh, General Hasnain said to project what Bangladesh is all about. Inclusivity and positivity. And then he made a point about the professionalism of the army. Uh, I've also interacted with, in fact, all of us have interacted with the Bangladesh army at uh, some point of time or the other. Um, 
in fact I, some of my students in uh, were from bangladesh army just around the time bangladesh got independence i'm going back to 80 81 right i've taught bangladeshi officers and i found them to be outstanding then and they remain so even now we've had good relations a uh, military diplomacy is something which we need to build on because that is something military to military relations are very good most of us have done ndc and higher command and you know ldmc and all those major courses with bangladeshi officers around us and even staff college right and i think we have a tremendous uh, shared history which again general uh, hasnain pointed out of 1971 Uh, which we need to build on because that is something which all indians connect with and that is something with 1971 is something which with all bangladesh is connected that's a common common point of our history indelible it cannot go away there are not two ways of that history or there not there are not two sides of that history it's only one side right and we need to look at our uh, divergences less and look at congruences more that's what he said and look at the development economic models revive the development economic model of bangladesh and which was pioneered by professor yunus long back right and the gam- garment industry i also agree with what uh, jal hasnain said look it's disrupted at this point of time but within one month no one will shift orders uh, wholesale to outside the country these things take time they will revive but the rider here is they will revive only if there's stability within the country if there's political stability in the country people yes. will come back to bangladesh if that doesn't happen well you will not you will run into problems that's something which we are also looking forward to that how fast will political stability come back into bangladesh uh, so thanks for all the comments i now request ambassador gautam mukhopadhyay So all yours. The floor is yours. Um, thank you very much, General Shankar. Thank you, um, General Murthy, for that excellent introduction, and General Atta, of course, uh, you know, for your um, you know extremely wise uh, remarks uh, um, uh, just before me. Uh, let me say that I have a bit of a cardinal rule that I don't actually speak on countries where I have not served and where I cannot claim um, any special expertise. Uh, so I am going to take, and especially since almost everything has been said, and I particularly echo the words of General Latta uh, when he counsels strategic patients, when he says that you know this is a time for passions uh, on both sides, and we can see that in the chat uh, box as well. Uh, that this is a time that, in fact, we uh, may it's a time of transition, um, and it's time that I think we don't need to react to every. Um, you know every uh, abuse or insult that is hurled towards each other and so my point here would be that i think it would be fitting to start by actually looking uh, a little introspectively into our own selves uh, whether the situation that we are faced in could possibly have been avoided uh, whether the reactions that we are seeing today are avoidable uh, and whether in fact we can work towards a a more stable relationship that we are fated to have as neighbors uh, as uh, neighbors that share you know 4000 kilometers of of borders as well so i think i'll just make two three points about bangladesh because i think in many ways this uh, also impinges on uh, you know our larger foreign policy and i'm going to look at this from that point of view so one point is you know we have seen the characterization of what's happened in bangladesh in various terms that it's a an american color revolution that it's anti india that it's islamist that it's pro pakistan um that it's anti hindu that it's not spontaneous that it is in fact not pure that it is uh, you know uh, a conspiracy uh, largely di- directed perhaps uh, we tend to view uh, towards india and so on i think you know these kind of reductionist uh, one dimensional explanations are not helpful what we are seeing on an occasion like this in a kind of massive upheaval virtually a revolution is a confluence of many many strains many many currents uh, just as you know as full of um, uh, of 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 channels as bangladesh itself is so i don't think it would be fair to describe as many of us i think in india tend to do in very one dimensional terms we need to get over that completely um in and but i think we have to face you know a couple of 
important facts that is that it was an anti hasina revolution that it was anti authoritarian um, that uh, it may that it had democratic uh, impulses it also had uh, some uh, islamist and anti indian and even anti hindu impulses i think we cannot deny that um, that you know indian properties indian symbols uh, even hindus uh, were attacked i think these are all part of what happened uh, but the, <clears throat> the key question is i think anybody from india who ever went to bangladesh knew that uh, the pot was simmering that it could boil any time over and until it happened i didn't see voices in india that predicted something was going to happen i didn't think i didn't see voices even amongst the critics in india who gave suggestions as to what it was possible to do uh, in order to prevent that a kind of explosion and i would say that in some respects again bangladesh also needs to look a uh, little in, uh, in introspectively which is that there was a total polarization a political polarization in bangladesh that did not permit indian policy makers to even move one foot this way or that way to explore possible options maybe these are certain limitations of our own foreign policy not being able to create the kind of space in which we can operate uh, you know and not find ourselves uh, polarized um so you know we have had an euphoric movement a euphoric moment when this uh, revolution took place but like all revolutions we need to look at the day after uh, you know we've had what happened in the arab spring uh, glorious moments but ultimately let's see uh, tehreek square led to the muslim brotherhood and then finally led to a kind of version of army rule back again uh, we need to look at what's happening in bangladesh from this point of view uh, this is not going to be a straight line uh, we need to look at the positive voices and i think uh, some of the points that both general murthy and general atha pointed out you know that there are positive voices in terms of secularism there is the idealism of youth there are the students who are still there uh, maybe in the end that spontaneity will be taken over by political forces but if we emphasize the negative we will only get more negativity if we emphasize the positive if we pick up the positive voices and start you know uh, responding to those then we have a better chance of creating a political space in which we can find an equilibrium and a, a kind of uh, you know a cohabitation and uh, so i think you know that's one key question that i would like to pose uh, or would like to make the second is um, you know the point that i think general um, uh, atta said which is at a time like this at a time of great froth froth uh, it is best for us to just simply lie low you know india is a big country we are neighbors uh, if we need bangladesh bangladesh will need india there will come a come a time when i think we realize each other's importance uh, india also knows very well that whatever mistakes it makes as a big country eventually our neighbors will need india at some point or the other this happened in afghanistan which i know very well uh, even the taliban um, who you know who were basically seen as at that time pakistan's creatures uh, came to see what reality was we have a perfectly good working relationship with the taliban now and it's pakistan who has a negative uh, relationship with uh, with the taliban at this moment uh, you know so india is a big country it can make mistakes and it can also correct its mistakes and its neighbors will also realize sometime or the other that you know you cannot do without each other so i think a little calmness in this respect is 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 good so at this point of time while passions are high it's best for us to lie low best for us to preserve that strategic patience and wait for the day when people both sides will realize that we have much more to gain by cooperation and let me tell you for all the bad things that may have happened during the begum hasina's time this was a time you know un until covid came and many other developments took place that bangladesh was prospering that india bangladesh relations had eased to the extent that there was much greater trade there was much greater investment we have all spoken about it there was much greater movement on transit than there has ever been in india bangladesh uh, or india east pakistan history um, so there were many positive developments during this period which were linked to uh, bangladesh's prosperity that we should not forget and that we should uh, work to develop on but one final point that i'd like to make you know and this is again relates to indian uh, foreign policy that 
India as a big country and has internalized this kind of big brother kind of attitude that our paradigms in terms of our relationship with the neighbors are cast in the big brother mold. So you either have the good big brother or you have the bad big brother. And so countries have to choose. There are some people who say, no, we will be the tough big brother. We don't care about our neighbors. And then we had the Gujarat doc doctrine that went to the other side and talked about, uh, you know, basically being nice to your uh, smaller neighbors. I think both these models, both these paradigms are patronizing. Uh, and I think it's about time that we got out of this patronizing uh, mold and move towards a mold of mutual respect. I think one of the chat um, contributors also made this point that we need to move away from this whole idea of, you know, my country first, started by the Americans, but now emulated by everyone. We need to uh, just rediscover an area, not just of self-interest, but of mutual interest and also enlightened self-interest. There is a whole spectrum that we can work on. And we need to move away from a kind of relationship of, you know, uh, of a patronizing relationship towards a much more level relationship, a level relationship which is not necessarily transactional, but which also builds upon the common cultural, religious, uh, you know, the huge, uh, the, the huge demand for Indian visas, whether it is to travel or it is to shop. Uh, pilgrimages uh, in India, including Islamist pilgrimages in India, uh, the huge sort of pool, common pool of culture that we have, uh, interest in our education centers, business, of course, uh, and of course, many transporter issues that we cannot work on. You know, Sundarbans is one, um, uh, climate change is another, global warming is another, the impact on the delta, the impact on salinity inside Bangladesh. These are all areas that we have to work on. So I actually want to then transit a little bit into Myanmar because, again, we have a challenge coming up. Bangladesh, we knew what was happening, but we did not know what to do. We knew that Bangladesh was going to explode, but we did not know how to deal with the transition. We closed our eyes until it happened. Now, we are facing a very similar problem in Myanmar. In Myanmar, too, we are dealing with the... In, in fact, in Bangladesh, it was much more hidden. In Myanmar, it's much more open. We are dealing with an extremely unpopular military government that has been in power since the 1960s, that in the last 10 years, to some extent, eased because of uh, initially civilian USDP rule, in other words, military-backed rule, and then subsequently civilian NLD rule, not completely democratic, but nevertheless at least a civilian and democratic rule. And then you had the coup of 19 of uh, 2021, February 1, 2021, which has reversed all the uh, progress that took place in Myanmar in terms of liberalization, political reforms, media space, opportunities for the youth uh, that had come up since uh, uh, since the liberalization in about 2011, uh, starting 20, 2011. To 2021. And once again, we are finding ourselves in a point of paralysis. Uh, there have been a lot of developments since 2021. Initially, when the coup took place, um, it, the, the first response to the coup was peaceful civil disobedience movements, peaceful protests, street protests. These were suppressed uh, very harshly by the military. And then you had the, uh, the situation that Ordinary people, ordinary youths from the Burma population as well as from the uh, ethnic areas simply, uh, you know, took to arms. Initially, they started with flint -lock rifles. The Burma simply did not even have their own uh, militant or, you know, uh, insurgent organizations or pro-democratic, you know, uh, armed organizations. They went to the ethnic armed organizations, ethnic resistance organizations, got trained and in the course of the next three years, starting with October last year, what we have seen is massive gains by the armed opposition all over Afghanistan, all over Myanmar, even while uh, the civil disobedience movement continues, continues to consolidate itself and has started the rudiments of a parallel administration. And once again, we have a situation where the armed opposition has taken over the Northeast Regional Command, uh, unprecedented in Myanmar's history, 
It has very recently, one of the groups, the Arakan Army, has taken over a naval base uh, close to Bay of Bengal. Uh, in other words, two major um, army and navy bases have fallen to the armed opposition. About 80 towns have come under the control of the opposition. Uh, you have nascent political organizations like the Committee of Parliamentarians, like the National Unity Government, uh, National Union Consultative Committee. You have armed coalitions like the Three Brotherhood Alliance. Uh, you have other armed uh, organizations like the Karenis and the Chins who have started their own rudimentary organization. All over Myanmar, there is uh, ferment. And it's difficult to predict because the army has such overwhelming monopoly of force. It's difficult to predict what will happen when. And of course, none of these things are ever predictable. And I think that's one of the lessons that we should learn from this. But the key point is this, that in three years, despite the strength of the Myanmar army, the Myanmar army has lost ground, has lost battlefield positions, has lost regional commands, has lost uh, major regional command bases as well as a uh, naval base. And the direction seems to be going only one way. Uh, and now what we are seeing is uh, other tendencies. You are seeing the Chinese moving in much more in support of the, uh, uh, the junta, the military junta, uh, in order to prevent a complete breakdown or a complete takeover by the armed opposition. And the more the Chinese get into the country, you will see other powers, like perhaps the United States getting into uh, uh, Myanmar in proxy positions. Increasingly, more and more of the border, of the border with India has fallen uh, into uh, uh, the ranks of the armed opposition. Most of the trading posts around Myanmar, whether it's the Indian side or in the China side or in the Thai side, are falling to the armed opposition. And once again, we are in a position where we are still going along with the flow, unable to read the writing on the wall and to be able to make the necessary course corrections. Uh, so in Bangladesh, we were caught by surprise. In Myanmar, we still have the opportunity to step back and review our options and see what we could do. Uh, so I would just leave uh, my intervention at that. Thank you, sir. I think you made some very, very, very interesting point. Uh, the first thing which you said is revolution is multidimensional. It is not, it's going to take its own course. It's not a straight line. The outcomes are still not known. But uh, what India has to realize is it's essentially anti Hasina. There's no doubt. Hasina is history, and we have to deal with the new dispensation, whichever comes our way. And we have to deal with it with both hands and both, I mean, in a, with uh, all our senses in uh, the right direction, right? And there will be impulses, negative impulses coming in all shades and all dimensions, which we need to sift and keep out. Otherwise, these irritants will only be sandpapers in our uh, relationship. And we need to do a lot of introspection in India and Bangladesh. It is not a one-way street. It's a, like I said, it, it, we need two hands to clap. All right. We need to build on the positives. And especially in Bangladesh, I think Bangladesh has a lot of opportunity. Well, a monsoon, I mean, uh, while the monsoon revolution is fine to talk of, uh, it has dangers and opportunities. The idealism of youth is something which they have to capitalize on. Or... They will go back into the into regressive politics, which existed in Bangladesh in the first 15, 20 years, a good part of their, uh, you know, growth story initially. When I say growth story, the gro uh, growth story as a nation, right? Uh, Bangladesh will need India at, because it's still simply the bigger nation and the more prosperous nation. And uh, India has, I mean, Bangladesh also has to realize that India has weathered its neighbors. You know, our relationship with neighbors are, has been always episodic. It's never been straight. Whether, whether you look at it, Maldives, uh, whether you look at Sri Lanka or Afghanistan or Bangladesh itself, and even with Myanmar, right? We've had phases of having very good relations. We have had phases of very uh, mediocre relations. 
and so we know and today the taliban model and the maldives model if i call it a model are good markers for bangladesh to assess how india will always hold your hand which i think that is very important but everyone in bangladesh should understand we know that bangladesh is going through a difficult period and india is next to you holding your hand not withstanding what kind of a feeling you are now emoting at this point of time i'll discount it completely right uh we need to build on the good things which have happened in the past 15 years uh, not with sending hasina or your views internally trade and transit relations we need uh, is important india needs to get out of its patronizing attitude i think that's a very important self correction which we have to make uh um, and we have to move to a area of mutual self interest then of course so you identify i mean you outlined the larger issues which is happening in myanmar where there's a unpopular junta in power for the i mean for ever since we known it barring the period when on son suji was in power <coughs> with the armed opposition you know gaining ground each day uh what strikes me about the whole thing which you said is that the military struggle is going to be long the political uh, stability reaching after the military struggle finishes is going to be even longer seeking politi- any kind of stability in uh, myanmar is going to be a very very long time i don't see the wall level on the writing which is even farther away right uh, relatively i think bangladesh things are little more at this point of time you can see through a lot of things you can see the shape of things which they come though they are easy it's a little more uh, predictable compared to myanmar but overall uh, the point which all of us have to understand and take away is both these countries are going to be in some kind of turbulence at least for the next 4 to 5 years and with our own issues in the northeast we have to take some hard decisions we have to do some hard introspection as a how do we deal with our problems like in manipur i mean i have no uh, uh, this thing in saying it openly with drones op- coming up out there and you know news of drones coming up and rockets coming up and the spillover of problems from myanmar entering into manipur and it the day is not far when the problems from bangladesh will go into that a- to our northeast and our northeast problems start finding harbor in bangladesh we all these are the dangers which we have gone through and we need to be alive to the whole thing right i uh, like uh, all of you have observed the commentary which has come today in terms of uh, the uh, how people have reacted largely is their own feelings which have come out which is good to the extent that their feelings are coming out uh, hasina's time is over you know we have she is history and we have to look ahead and i'm sure like us like four of us here in india there's a whole lot of people in india who have the same view and who want to uh, build bridges with uh, or rather i won't say build bridges strengthen the existing bridges with uh, bangladesh and take it from where we have we, we have to count on what we have achieved not on what we have broken right or what life broken because in any journey you can't you have to look you know when you drive a car you have to look through the windshield you can't drive a car with a rear view mirror right that's the only thing which i'll tell at the end uh with this sir uh thanks a lot for participating in the show i'm not taking more questions because they're more emotive and we've spoken quite a lot then gautam murthy sir last word from you and then you could say jai hind to all of us thank you very much general shankar uh, general lasne and sir uh, ambassador gautam mukhopadhyay for making this such a lively and wonderful discussion and uh, thank you viewers for your comments as we have said uh, you see if you have the time and the inclination to watch this show uh, i would urge all of you who watch keep watching gunner shot to to ask relevant questions pertaining to subject <coughs> make relevant comments there's no point driving negativity further and further and this is what the social media has done to us i would urge you to stay away from this kind of a thing and i think general lasnain uh, brought it out very wonderfully when he spoke 
So thank you all very much for participating in this uh, webinar. Uh, thank you all. Uh, good night. Uh, Jai Hind. God bless you all. Thank you, sir. Jai Hind. Jai Hind. Jai Hind. Jai Hind. Jai Hind.